Hello and welcome to the pre-recorded webinar for the school year 22-23 online testing infrastructure matching grant. This is a pre-recorded grant webinar that will share high level information about the grant eligibility and the application process. This webinar will also address some program FAQs. Potential applicants with additional questions can email studentassessment at tea.texas.gov in order to submit an FAQ. The FAQ posting will be available on the TEA Grant Opportunities page. In this webinar, anything with orange bolded text with an errata marker will indicate a change or clarification in the program guidelines. An errata will be posted the week of February 1st, 2022 to reflect these mentioned changes. Here we have the agenda for today's webinar. First, we have the overview of the competitive matching grant. Then we will talk through the grant eligibility guidelines. After that, we will run through the grant application process, then the grant scoring and review of applications for competitive award, then we will cover the post-award performance metrics, and lastly, we will end with frequently asked questions. The Online Testing Infrastructure Matching Grant, or the OTI Matching Grant, was created to support districts in their transition to meet the requirements of House Bill 3261. For some background, House Bill 3906, passed in 2019, proposed the possibility of a full state transition to online summative testing by the 22-23 school year. To inform this potential transition, the online feasibility study was conducted to study district's readiness to move towards online testing. House Bill 3261 was then passed in 2021, confirming the state's move to online testing, starting with the December 2022 administration. It also included the expanded allowable uses for the technology and instructional materials allotment to cover internet connectivity and training for online testing. On top of that, it also permitted TEA to implement a matching grant to support one-time network infrastructure investments. What is the OTI matching grant? It is a competitive letter of intent grant in which there is $4 million of funds available. The purpose of the grant is to support campuses as they acquire the infrastructure necessary in order to reach 500 kilobits per second per student tester by March of 2023. House Bill 3261 requires that the full online testing transition begins in December of 22, which consists primarily of EOC retesters. The grant itself will allow for project spending until March of 2023, because that is when the main administration of STARS grade three through eight and EOC tests occur. These matching grants are meant to support entities with funds otherwise not covered by the E-rate discount. In terms of the grant structure, grant funds will be provided in two mutually exclusive categories, and applicants can apply for one or both tiers. If both tiers are of interest to the applicant, they are required to submit separate applications for each of them, which will be talked later in the webinar. Tier one is focused on getting internet to each campus. This looks like establishing connections that are stable and scalable running into each building. We recommend last mile fiber, but we'll be accepting applications for other alternatives in case there are more cost-friendly options that can be adopted within the project timeframe. The grant will cover the equipment and materials to set up the connection, as well as any one-time setup charges. A maximum of $1.3 million out of the $4 million bucket will be awarded under Tier 1, with the rest of the funds flowing into Tier 2. Tier 2 is focused on getting that internet connection through the building and into each tester's device. 
only hardware costs and one-time setup charges will be covered. Some examples of such hardware include routers, switches, and antennas. This grant will not cover any monthly or recurring costs as it is focused on establishing that physical infrastructure. So what makes this a matching grant? Something that we want to make really clear ahead of time is that this grant is only made available to LEAs who make steps towards applying for the e rate Federal Grants Program for funding year 2022. This grant will not cover expenses that otherwise could be covered through the federal E-rate program. It will amount to 50% of the out-of-pocket expenses remaining after E-rate that are necessary for the LEA to meet the requirements of House Bill 3261. In terms of the matching grant formula, the maximum grant allocation cap per awarded LEA is determined by starting with the 100% of the project costs, subtracting the E-rate funding for the project, and taking 50% of that remaining amount. An entity's E-rate funding is determined by their E-rate discount, which takes into account its urban or rural classification, as well as the percentage of students that are eligible for the National School Lunch Program. Here is an example of how the formula would be applied. An LEA needs to purchase $20,000 worth of internal connection equipment in order to meet the requirements of House Bill 3261. That falls into Tier 2 of the grant. They have a 50% discount rate for E-rate Category 2, and therefore $10,000 will be covered through E-rate funding itself. The remaining $10,000 will be split 50-50 between LEA funds and the OTI matching grant. We want to remind applicants that all details and information about the OTI matching grant can be found on the TEA grant opportunities page. When you go in that page, you can search for 2022-2023 TEA online testing infrastructure matching grant. That will land you on the page that you see on the left hand side and you can access the application and support information down at the bottom for the following um, that includes program guidelines the applications itself required attachments and any other changes or updates to the program such as erratas or links to recorded webinars all of the remaining information presented in this webinar can be referenced back to the program guidelines. So we also encourage you to read that very closely prior to submission of your application. Now we will walk through the second part of the agenda, which is the grant eligibility guidelines. Who is eligible for the grant? Any applicant who has at least one campus with less than one megabits per second per student tester may apply for the grant. Applicants may apply as one of the following. Most likely the applicant is an individual LEA, which includes both traditional and charter school districts. Applicants may also apply as an SSA on behalf of eligible LEAs within their purview. An example would be an E-rate consortium in which the applicant would submit the consortium's FCC Form 471. It can also be an ESC that is not a consortium, though most data must be pulled at this campus level and as a result may not be worth the ESC's efforts. Individual campuses may not apply as a standalone entity for the purposes of this grant, even though they can do so for the federal E-rate program. Instead, they must apply through their LEA. One other note that we would like to make is that SSAs are limited to applying on behalf of a maximum of 10 LEAs, including the fiscal agent themselves. All of these LEAs must be rural. If an urban LEA within a consortium is interested in applying, the LEA must apply as a standalone entity for the purposes of the grant and attach the consortium's FCC Form 471. We will now go into allowable and non-allowable costs by tier, starting with tier one. 
a maximum of $1.3 million will be awarded in this tier. Eligible items for Tier 1 fit neatly under the E-rate Category 1. Allowable costs include the network equipment to establish internet connection, as well as the one-time installation, activation, or configuration charges to set up that internet connection. Eligible costs include special construction, installation, and activation charges, modulating electronics and other equipment necessary to make a Category 1 broadband service functional. According to E-rate guidelines, all equipment and services must be competitively bid. Applicants may seek special construction funding for the upfront non-recurring costs for the deployment of new or upgraded facilities. The eligible components of special construction are construction of network facilities, design and engineering, and project management. Non-allowable costs are any internet access charges, which are the ongoing monthly payments given to internet service providers. Any other ongoing costs are also not allowed, such as maintenance and operation charges. TEA most recommends the establishment of last mile fiber to meet online testing requirements. If establishing last mile fiber is too costly or does not fit within the timeline, a fixed wireless alternative is recommended. The application narrative will ask the applicant to provide an explanation on the selection of the internet connection type for each campus. Other types of connections can also be considered under the purview of the grant. Moving on to Tier 2's allowable and non-allowable costs. At least $2.7 million will be awarded in this tier, as any Tier 1 funds that are unawarded will flow into this tier. In terms of allowable costs, this includes hardware to establish internal connections, such as routers, cabling, switches, and antennas, as well as the one-time installation, activation, or configuration charges for the hardware itself. In terms of non-allowable costs, that includes, again, any ongoing charges, such as maintenance and operation charges that are monthly, it also includes any software, such as firewall services and firewall components, as well as software supports to distribute high-speed broadband. This is a new change in our program that we have incorporated in our errata that is upcoming. Please note that any cost not eligible under E-rate Category 2 is automatically going to be an unallowable cost for Tier 2. Please refer to USAC's 2022 Eligible Services list for more details. Let's talk about some examples of Tier 2 costs. Tier 2 allowable costs fall under the E-rate Category 2 cost components. That includes broadband internal connections, as well as eligible managed internal broadband services. Allowable costs include both the equipment to establish the WAN and LAN network, as well as the associated one-time service costs. Looking at some examples under broadband internal connections, that includes antennas, connectors, and related components used for internal broadband connections, cabling, caching, racks, routers, switches, UPS battery backup, access points used in a local area network or wireless local area network environment, such as wireless access points, as well as wireless controller systems. As a reminder, all of these examples are only hardware, as software is not allowable under this grant. Looking under the eligible managed internal broadband services, Examples here would include the initial management and operation of the LAN or WLAN, including installation, activation, and initial configuration of eligible components and on-site training on the use of this eligible equipment. In terms of non-allowable cost examples for Tier 2, 
Tier 2 non-allowable costs also fall squarely under E-rate Category 2 cost components. This time it has to do with part of the broadband internal connections, as well as basic maintenance of internal connections. While software such as firewall services and other software supports fall under broadband internal connections, this grant does not cover software, partially due to its nature of being recurring costs. Basic maintenance of internal connections is also a recurring cost, as you can see on the right-hand side. This includes repair and upkeep of eligible hardware, wiring cable maintenance, configuration charges, basic technical support, including online and telephone-based technical support, software upgrades and patches, including bug fixes and security patches, um, as well as some examples that we have listed here under the bullets. Now we will move on to agenda item number three, the grant application process. There have been several changes in the grant timeline to better accommodate grant applicants, namely giving applicants more time to apply. All of these changes will be reflected in the upcoming program guidelines errata. The most important change to note is that the application deadline is updated to April 4th of 2022. Additionally, the FAQ publications have been pushed back to align with the upcoming FCC Form 471 support webinars, which are also listed out on this slide. More information is going to be provided in later slides around these live webinars. Lastly, the anticipated grant award announcement date is now going to be June 6 of 2022. All applications are due by 11.59 p.m. Central Time on April 4, 2022. Each grant application must be sent directly to loiapplications.tea.texas.gov. One thing we'd really like to emphasize is the fact that applicants must submit a PDF copy of their FCC Form 471 from funding year 2022 in order to qualify. This form is a required part of the E-rate application process, and we recommend you get started on this as soon as possible, given the fact that this process is fairly involved. The remaining information, as you can see under application and support information, um, will require a lot of information that will flow directly from the FCC Form 471. Applicants who are interested in applying for both Tier 1 and Tier 2 funds will need to complete two separate application submissions. As you can see, Tier 1 will have its own set of required documents, and Tier 2 will have its own set of required documents. Some of the information may be duplicate if one applies for both tiers, but for the most part, it does require different data and different narratives. For the ease of tracking, TEA asks that Tier 1 and Tier 2 applications to be submitted as separate emails. An application prerequisite that we have mentioned a few times already is having the PDF copy of the FCC Form 471 prepared. This form has to reflect the needs of the LEA's funding year 2022. For some background, the FCC Form 471 is the second form that must be filed in the E-rate application process. Its purpose is to individually list all contracts and services for which the applicant is requesting discounts from the federal government. The form requires information on the recipients of service and the service provider, detailed descriptions of services, including costs and dates of services or equipment, and a certification of compliance with program rules. So all requested funds in the grant application must be traceable back to the FCC Form 471 for the E-rate funding year of 2022. SSAs that are not part of an E-rate consortia must submit an FCC Form 471 for each individual LEA. E-rate consortia applying for the grant will submit one FCC Form 471. Additional assistance on the FCC Form 471 can be found in three ways. 
One is to potentially reach out to your local ESC's technology team in case they have additional resources. Two is calling the complimentary E-Rate Help Desk service hosted by Region 12 at the following number. Three is by attending the E-Rate live webinar series focused on Form 471, and that will have more details in the next slide. Details on how to file the FCC Form 471 can be found on the Universal Service Administrator Companies or USAC's website and the filing is done online through the E-Rate Productivity Center. A live webinar series that focuses on supporting districts with FCC Form 471 will be publicly available. This is namely for applicants who need additional support with the FCC Form 471 prerequisite, and these webinars will be hosted by GROW Associates. These webinars will follow a general format in which they will provide high-level information on how to complete the form, and they will also have an open Q&A session uh, to answer specific questions around the FCC Form 471. Please note that the webinar series will be focused on that particular topic. Applicants with questions specific to the OTI matching grant will need to email studentassessment at tea.texas.gov and have questions addressed through these FAQ postings that you can see the schedule in the grant timeline. These live webinars will be held at 9 a.m. Central Time in four dates. If an applicant were to miss these webinars, these recordings can actually be accessed through the TEA Grant Opportunities page. Interested applicants can access the registration links available in the program guidelines errata. After an applicant generates their FCC Form 471 form, they can move on to fill out the campus level program planning attachment or CLPPA. This Excel file will have four primary sections and we can start by looking at the data by LEA. This information should be fairly straightforward, but if a standalone LEA is applying, please note that all the rows in this first section will be the same. Also note that more information around each of these sections will be provided in the CLPP document itself under row 12. The next primary section of the CLPPA is data by campus. Campus ID, campus name, total enrollment is all pretty straightforward. We also ask you to incorporate total grades 3 through 12 enrollment. This is going to be used to estimate campus eligibility, which we will talk about under the audit generated section. The application also requires total bandwidth download speeds recorded in megabits per second. Each eligible campus within this application must run the network diagnostic tool in order to share their local download speeds. There's more information on how to use this tool in later slides. There's also a requirement of putting in anticipated bandwidth in megabits per second by project and completion. This is just going to be a estimate um, that you can ask your vendor about as well. Lastly, this requires the anticipated project completion date. Please note that all projects must be complete by March 31st of 2023. If a project may take longer than that, it is likely like they are not qualified for this grant. The FCC Form 471 data is the third section in the CLPPA. Most of this data can be pulled directly from the Form 471. An example here would be the BEN number, the NSLP percentages, the urban or rural status, as well as the E-rate discount rates. Applicants are also required to select the type of cost that they're requesting row by row. So for tier one, they can select between last mile fiber and alternative to fiber or the one-time service charge. For tier two, applicants can pick between broadband internal connections or managed internal broadband services. 
Again, for tier two, all of this is going to be focused around hardware as well as the service fees to set up that hardware. Lastly, the applicant will input total one-time eligible costs. All of these costs must be traceable back to the Form 471, and all of this must reflect a pre-discount rate. So all of these costs need to be before the E-rate discount as well as before the state match discount. The last section of the CLPPA is an auto-generated section. These have locked cells that cannot be modified because they contain formulas so that the section can estimate some of the outputs that you might need to incorporate in other parts of your application. So it will generate the E-rate discount amount by looking at your E-rate discount as well as their total one-time eligible costs inputted in section three. It will also generate the out-of-pocket amount, um, which is the amount post E-rate discount. It will also cut that number in half and as a result generate the maximum potential state match amount. And this is what you will be putting actually within your budget application, which is the application part two. It will also generate bandwidth per student testers in megabits per second. So that is done by taking um, what you have in section two, which is the total bandwidth download speeds and dividing that by the total grades three through 12 enrollment, which is our estimate on student testers within each campus. And lastly, it will also generate the anticipated bandwidth per student testers in megabits per second at project end. In order to generate total bandwidth download speeds for the CLPPA, campuses must access the Cambium Network Diagnostic Tool. This tool must be run at each campus requesting grant funds. It is recommended that campuses run this diagnostic during school hours in multiple areas of the campus where testing would occur. From there, the applicant should record the weakest area of the building where the campus plans to test student online. As an example, if the cafeteria is where the campus plans to conduct bulk online testing in the spring and it has the weakness signal, that is the total bandwidth download speed that should be recorded in the campus level program planning attachment. After the applicant completes the CLPPA, it is now time to move forward with completing the application part one. It is important that if an applicant wants to apply to both tiers of the grant, there needs to be one separate application per tier. We highly encourage applicants to refer to the program guidelines for the specific prompts within this narrative section. On the right hand side, we have a screenshot of one part of the narrative section. And as you can see, this first part is around the summary of the program. The program guidelines themselves will provide more guidance on what we're looking for within each specific tier. So an example here is for tier one, we would be asking applicants to describe the type of internet connection that's requested, explain how it meets the goal of the project, and also justify how this is the best option for scalable and stable internet. For tier two, we ask that applicants describe the equipment or services needed across campuses in what role each of these pieces play in achieving state requirements. There are a couple key things to remember when it comes to filling out application part one. The narrative portions of the application should be driven by information by the CLPPA. SSA should complete each section with specific information regarding each member of their SSA. It is also important for us to highlight the grant applicant assurances that will be filled out in the application part one. First, the application provides assurance that FCC Form 471 meets the funding year 2022 E-rate application standard. 
the applicant provides assurance that the data provided in the campus level program planning attachment is substantiated by the information listed in the FCC Form 471. Some of the times what is requested under the CLPPA is going to be just a subset of those FCC Form 471 costs, and that is okay. The applicant provides assurance that it plans to apply or has already applied for the funding year FY22 E-rate funding cycle. The applicant provides assurance that it has used the Cambium Network Diagnostics tools to evaluate and report campus eligibility for the funds. The applicant provides assurance that it only has requested funds for campuses that do not currently have the minimum testing bandwidth. We have allowed campuses that have less than one megabits per second per student tester to apply for this grant. The applicant provides assurance that it plans to achieve minimum testing bandwidth by the anticipated project completion date as specified in the CLPPA. As mentioned, that anticipated project completion date cannot be later than March 31st, 2023. Application part two should only be filled out once the CLPPA is complete. The applicant will take the costs from column T of the CLPPA, which outlines the max potential state match amount and bucket those amounts into three sections within this application part two budgeting document. The first bucket will be the 1600 professional and contracted services, which covers any one-time installation or service costs. 6300 or supplies and materials covers any equipment costs with individual units of under $5,000 or at the district capitalization level, whichever is less. 6600 or capital outlay covers any equipment costs with individual units of over $5,000 or the district capitalization level, whichever is less. There are multiple tabs within this document and some of these tabs will be grayed out, namely the payroll cost section as well as other operating costs. This means that those sections are not eligible for the grant as they are non-allowable costs, and as a result, it does not need to be filled out. There is a final budget summary tab in which the applicants will look at after the first three buckets are filled out. Most of this should be auto-populated with the exceptions of these two highlighted cells. When it comes to the indirect costs, this is based on the LEA percentage that is previously approved. For this grant, we are allowing the unrestricted rate. More information on this can be found in the program guidelines. Lastly, there is the yellow highlighted cell of 6493. This is only for our SSA applicants. If they themselves is a fiscal agent um, and also an LEA, they're going to keep a portion of their funds that they're requesting overall. The remaining that will go to members of the SSA should be recorded here in the last yellow box as the final amount that is given over to those other LEAs. Now we are going to talk about grant scoring and review of applications for competitive award. As mentioned earlier, application part one has a narrative section that the applicant is required to fill out. This is going to be the main part of the scoring and review of the grant. Data in the CLPPA attachment may also be used as supplemental information in the review and scoring process. Overall, looking at the narrative sections of this application part one, there are five sections and more information on how to fill out these sections, again, is in the program guidelines. The narratives must address how the requested costs for the grant fulfill the purposes of the grant.
The TEA program team will evaluate the quality of these narratives and award up to 100 points based on that. Rural applicants will automatically be given 30 priority points. TEA will be using USAC's definition of urban or rural to make that determination. Now we will talk about post-award performance metrics. In terms of post-award program performance measures, there are a couple that exist for the grant to ensure that grantees are moving towards these two goals over the course of the grant. The first one is that 100% of campuses receiving funding should have bandwidth of at least 500 kilobytes per second per concurrent tester in time for summative testing in school year 22-23. The second metric is that 100% of campuses receiving funding should have all students testing online in time for summative testing in school year 22-23. It's important to note that in terms of school year 22-23, all end of course testing must be online by December of 22. Grades three through five, as well as EOCs, must be online by spring of 2023. TEA's program team is still in the process of finalizing this tracking process. Upon grant award, we will provide grantees with more details on how this will be done. Lastly, we will talk through the FAQs that we've received so far. If you are interested in only some parts of this FAQ, we encourage you that you jump forward to the corresponding question that you are looking for. Question one, can a standalone ESC apply? ESCs can only apply as a fiscal agent on behalf of an SSA. The ESC itself cannot apply for grant funds for its own use. Given the fact that most of the information requested in this grant occurs at the campus level, it might not be worth it for the ESC to be applying on behalf of its LEAs, but we wanted to just open up that option in case that was something that ESCs was interested in. Question two, what E-rate documents do SSAs submit on behalf of their LEAs? First of all, an SSA would typically look like one of the following, an E-rate consortium or an ESC. An SSA can apply on behalf of a maximum of 10 LEAs, all of which must be rural. If there are more than 10 rural LEAs, then some of these LEAs need to apply separately. If an urban LEA wants to apply but is part of a consortium, they must apply as a standalone LEA. The LEA then can submit their consortium's FCC Form 471 within their application. If an SSA is a consortium that only covers perhaps one E-rate category but not the other, but the SSA itself wants to apply for both tiers, then it must apply the relevant FCC Form 471s that are tied to the requested funds. So that would include maybe a consortium generated FCC Form 471 for Category 1 costs, and then a, a compilation of the LEA-generated FCC Form 471s for Tier 2 costs, just as an example. Question 3. Does the required information in Attachment 2 come directly from the FCC Form 471? Yes, all requested grant funds must be traceable back to the FCC Form 471 for funding year 2022. The grant does not cover funds requested through the E-rate cycle for funding year 2021. Question four, are firewalls an allowable purchase under the grant? No, only hardware equipment and one-time services for installation or activation are allowable purchases under the grant. Firewalls and other software are not allowable costs. And this is something that is new that has been incorporated in our upcoming program guidelines errata. Question five, could the grant cover allowable funds that were incurred in the past? No, the grant period is June 6, 2022, depending on the actual grant announcement date, to March 31st, 2023. Costs incurred outside of the grant period are not eligible for this grant. In other words, LEAs may not begin project spending until the grant awards are announced, which is anticipated to be June 6 of 2022. The end date of the grant, which is March 31st, 2023, represents the last date in which project costs may be incurred. 
Grantees have 60 days after the grant end date to submit documentations and draw down upon their awarded funds. Question six, could the grant cover allowable funds that were not included in our funding year 2022 SCC Form 471? No, if the applicant did not include projected project costs under their Form 471, then these costs are not eligible for the grant. The grant requires quotes that have undergone an RFP process and are upheld to the same standard as the federal E-rate process. Question seven, what if only one building within a campus qualifies for the grant? Bandwidth recorded in the CLPPA should reflect the weakest point of the network across buildings associated with that campus. More information on how to use the network diagnostic tool can be found on slide 25. It may be that only one building does not have the required bandwidth for testing. It is important to ensure that the requested funds in the CLPPA reflects the costs needed to upgrade the building's network infrastructure to meet House Bill 3261 requirements. In regards to enrollment, that needs to be recorded in the CLPPA and reflect the entire campus's enrollment. Question eight. Are we eligible if proposed projects do not increase overall internet speed, but will improve overall Wi-Fi coverage? Yes, the goal of the grant is to ensure that bandwidth in all testing areas meet the required minimum. If a campus is getting a fast internet connection to their building, but their building is not optimized to spread the connection across their classrooms and into student devices, they are likely needing Tier 2 funding to help accomplish that. Question nine, how is the bandwidth per student tester determined for DAEP campuses that are a part of a consortium? All special schools, including DAEP campuses, must apply through their LEA. In the case of an off-campus DAEP where multiple districts has formed a consortium, the consortium members must decide which LEA is applying for the grant. Only one application per DAEP campus is allowed per tier. In order to generate the enrollment counts for the DAEP, the applicant can sum up student enrollment in the campus across all participating districts. Bandwidth per student is then determined by taking the total bandwidth speed in MBPS and dividing that by the sum of grades three through 12 enrollment across all participating districts of that DAEP. Question 10, is there any flexibility in the matching grant amount? No, if the applicant is selected for an award, the matching grant formula would apply. As mentioned earlier, it is taking the 100% of the project costs, subtracting out the E-rate funding for the project, multiplying that by 50%, and that would generate the OTI matching grant allocation. No exceptions can be made to increase this match amount as TEA will only cover 50% of the costs outside of the E-rate discount. Thank you so much for your interest in the OTI matching grant. We hope that this webinar was helpful to you. If there are any additional questions, please submit them to studentassessment at tea.texas.gov. Thank you.